So if you've got your Bibles, let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Seems to be a weird time that we live in right now. Uh, as you know, I watch a lot of stuff. I watch a lot of interviews. Um, oddly enough, I watch a lot of the street preaching that they record and put on YouTube. And it's not always grand and glorious, you know. But I see something happening that did catch my attention and I watch these things often so but I see a lot of people that's been born into a family that goes to church and they're comfortable if that's a good way to put it with the church atmosphere and they're asked well why don't you attend church anymore and they said the church just doesn't have anything for me going to church doesn't have anything for me but they were raised in church. And then you watch the interviews with some of these other people. And one recently, some of you might have seen this one because it, it got a little more attention. One of the churches of Satan in Africa. Y'all heard about that one? The founder of one of the satanic churches in Africa was going through one of his rituals. And something happened. He had a he had a a Paul moment. Jesus came into the scene in his satanic ritual. And he was born again. Since then he has renounced everything. He's even shut down the church that he started, the satanic church. Shut it down and now he's Speaking the gospel, he doesn't know how to preach. He doesn't know how to do anything. Doesn't know anything about it. But he's sharing his experience about what God did for him. So, my mind at that point, you know, that little hamster, he is wide open. Okay, that little wheel is smoking. You've got these people that were born and raised in church saying the church just don't have anything for me, and you got this one that was rooted in evil and Satan. Teaching people evil and wickedness that had a Jesus moment and completely t turn, t t turned his life around and changed. What's going on here? Why is those that are taught Jesus turning from Jesus and those that have been against Jesus are turning to Him? Now, it's great that they're turning to Jesus. But this other generation of people that's, that should be deeply rooted in the gospel by now. The difference between an encounter and education. Amen. That's exactly it. It's sad, too, that some of the so called churches are becoming that way where they're not hearing the gospel. And there are some that's that way. Um, they're concentrating. Amen. When, when the Spirit is on the scene, the Spirit will be in charge. Okay? We can't make the Spirit work. We got to let Him be in control of us. So, just something for y'all to think about. I, I thought about that this weekend as I watched this, and it just got me to thinking. All right, Ephesians chapter 3. Now, Ephesians. Galatians and Ephesians, both of these specifically, as we study on who we are in Christ, I think they are great letters or great epistles for us to be studying. Um, who we are in Christ is a big thing. 
And a lot of people don't truly know and understand who they are in Christ. But Ephesians especially, especially uh, talking the kind of a, a theme is to the redeemed, is to the born again. It is a lot of instruction in here as to how Christians are supposed to live their life, how we're supposed to think, our attitude. You know, we've mentioned it before. Sometimes there's Christians that seems like they've been baptized in vinegar. They come up all shriveled up and they're, you know, who wants to, who wants to invite them over for hamburgers and hot dogs? If we'll dig into this, this tells us the type of attitude Christians are supposed to have. That attitude is not just toward other Christians. That attitude is toward the whole world. Good and bad alike. Right and wrong. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation, so don't let the big words mess with you, this just means the administration of, okay? The way it's done. If ye have heard of the administration, the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you. So it's given to Paul so that he can give it to the Gentiles just like he got it. Okay? Same thing. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Okay? This mystery is the grace which has been talked about in previous chapters here in Ephesians. How that by revelation... Now we need to explain something about revelation. I personally believe there is no new revelation. We have revelation on what this means. But God's already put everything in plan. It's already in motion. The end times is on their way. Okay? Think back to uh, all these past years on TV where you had this great, so-called great, prophet or evangelist or somebody, personally that I've never heard of any of them, that says on this date, at this time, the world is going to come to an end. God revealed this to me. Keyword, He revealed this to me. And guess what happens? It didn't happen. And now suddenly the whole world is against Christianity and all Christians because this one idiot who claimed to be something that wasn't spoke on behalf of God and said, I got a new revelation. Now the Word of God says nobody knows. No man knows and he's not going to know. So whenever they claim a new revelation that says, despite the Word of God, God showed me this anyway, they're lying through their teeth. Okay? But Paul said, by revelation, whenever we study, study to show yourselves approved unto God, right? Whenever we study, we dig into this Word and we start to see some things unfolding in the Scriptures. We start to understand some things. That is revelation of the existing Word of God. That is what Paul got from Jesus, from the Spirit. He had divine revelation. We still have access to that today, folks. How that by revelation He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And there's a, if you flipped over to Colossians, uh, there's a, some things in there about that revelation and about that grace, that mystery being grace and that mystery being Jesus. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. So Jesus and grace was not revealed to people in the Old Testament times the same way that it's revealed to people in the New Testament times. Right? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the Gospel. Keep in mind, we are Gentiles. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace 
of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power, by the strong working of His power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Don't let unsearchable mess with you. My brain says unsearchable means I can't, I can't search it. I can't look at it. That's not what it means. It means limitless. The limitless working of His power. Okay? The, I know King James, for, it take, when it says study to show yourself approved, King James is one of them. You've got to learn some of these words. They don't always mean in English what we think. Amen. Now, I think there's a good lesson in verse 8 for us about how we are to act, how we're to treat people. Paul said, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Okay, if you've got the max or the best and you've got the least, they're at the bottom of the totem pole. We know, we know what totem poles are, right? Paul says, I'm less than this one down here at the bottom of the totem pole. He's not bragging. He's not building himself up to be something. And let's just face reality. There's a lot of preachers in this world today that's more concerned about how many people knows them than how many people's getting the gospel and getting right with them with with Jesus. An expression of extreme humility. I like that. An expression of extreme humility. We're supposed to be humble, right? I believe there's Scripture that talks about those that are boastful, those that are proud, those that thinks more of themselves than they're supposed to. Don't think more of yourself than you ought to. God will bring you down. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. So God has given it to Paul. Why? That he can preach among the Gentiles the limitless riches of Christ. How many of us in here realizes that yes, we are learning from the writings of Paul right now, the Word of God. But at the same time, if you're in here and you're a Christian, you're also a minister. This is one of those little things that gets me sometimes. Everybody wants to pack it off on the preacher and the pastor. This is your job. This is your job. This is your job. Where's y'all's job? The Word of God. Sheep by our sheep, right? Sheep by our sheep. Well, how do you buy our sheep if you never go tell anybody about Jesus? To minister the Word is just like giving your testimony. It is sharing the Gospel. Right? Feed the pastor's job, the preacher's job is to feed the sheep. You know how many people I have successfully got to come to church? Very few. You know why? Whenever they find out you're the pastor and the preacher, they start crawfishing. You know what crawfishing is? I always pick on Terry, it's, it's fun. He don't care. What happens whenever you stick something in front of a crawfish? No, they flip that tail and they shoot backwards really fast. You start trying to catch a crawfish, you put something behind him, and you show him something in front of him and he runs backwards. Right into your hand, right into your little wire basket, whatever you're catching him with. He crawfishes, he runs backwards. Somebody finds out you're the preacher or the pastor and you're inviting them to church, the first thing they do is crawfish. Their own. That's the reason sheep bear sheep. Somebody else in the congregation can say, "Well, if you don't go to church, come. Why don't you come to church with us?" You know, and they tell all the things that they enjoy about coming to church, and then their friend, who, okay, if it's okay with them, then it'll be okay with me. I'll go. But you let the pastor do it. No. It just, that's the way it works. 
Okay? Sheep bear sheep. In that same sense, Paul is given the instruction to give to us, all Christians, not just pastors and preachers, not just evangelists, not just the fivefold ministry, but all Christians have that same ministry to share the gospel. The Great Commission, anybody heard of that one? That's never mentioned around here, is it? The Great Commission. Get outside these four walls and share the gospel to every creature, to every nation. Let's be real. If it was just limited to the uh, preachers and teachers and pastors and evangelists and prophets, there ain't enough of them to cover the world. But when you get all of God's people in there, you get all the Christians in there, there's enough to cover the world. And it's happening as we speak. Just because we're sitting in here learning and growing, getting fed spiritually, doesn't mean somebody's not out there on the spiritual battlefield wading through the bushes out somewhere that's never even heard of Jesus to share the Gospel. Putting their life on the line. So, Paul shared it. We share it too. Verse 9 says, "...and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery." which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Well, those things are no longer hid in God, are they? Those things came out with Jesus. Verse 10, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold, that just means a lot. Uh, multifaceted. I used that word the other night. Multifaceted. There's a lot to it. It's a lot of different stuff. Uh, the, the great wisdom of God. Now what about these principalities and powers? What's that? What's principalities and powers? To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places... We're not, uh, it's been one of them days, the brain hamster fell out of the wheel again. Uh, We wrestle not, it's it's coming, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. All principalities, okay, in that scripture, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That is wicked things. That's evil things. This is not specific to good or bad. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, this is, think of it as different ranks of angelic beings. Okay? You mean there's ranks of angels? Yeah, yeah it is. There is ranks of angels, good and bad. How many angels are listed by name in the Bible? Gabriel, Michael, and the big, bad, ugly one, Lucifer. Can't forget, Lucifer is an angel. Fallen, but an angel. There's only three named by name, but there's unknown number of angels. Now these three had special positions and special abilities, special authorities. You know, what about Lucifer, the angel of... Light, right? And you've got warrior angels. You've got you know, Gabriel and Michael. That's not somebody, that's not an angel I'd want to mess with. They have special, they were created for special things. Okay? Think of them as a higher rank than the others. These principalities and powers, that's, that's all it's talking about. Different ranks. Different levels. You've heard of Going over into the demon side of things, you've heard of prince demons? You ever heard that term before? That's a higher ranking demon. He has more, I guess you want to say power, than some of the others. Does that mean he has power over us? He can have all the power of Satan himself, but he still don't have power over us. 
So to the intent that now unto the principalities and the powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Anybody in here as a Christian, do you have boldness? If you don't, God give it to you. That's what we've been talking about. All the things God's given people. We just got to understand who we are in Christ and know that He's given it to us. He has given all of His people boldness. Take it. If you're not bold in the Spirit, bold in the Scriptures, bold in who you are in Christ, accept the boldness that Jesus has given you. Take it and use it. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence. What does that mean with confidence? It means you don't have any doubts. It's faith. No doubts, no fears. This boldness, this excess, access with confidence, no doubts, no fears, by the faith of Him. And Him is Jesus. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you which is your glory. Well, what do you think he would say that? Don't be discouraged because how many of us in here as Christians, we have all the answers and we know everything that God has planned. We know it all. We don't. None of us do. Okay? Don't matter what, who, on, there's one person that knew more than any other human being, and that's Jesus. But when it comes to the end time, whenever God's going to say, all right, it's over, does Jesus even know that date and time yet? No. no. Something to think about. So He doesn't have 100% of the knowledge of God. But He has way more than we got. He has all the knowledge of God save that one moment when God says it's over. Now, Paul is saying, you're looking at me as a teacher. You're looking at me as a preacher. I'm giving you the gospel. In a lot of ways, Paul is giving correction to some false teaching that happens in some of the letters. But he's saying, don't be discouraged because you're receiving these teachings of God through a man that's in prison. Be real. That's my big thing. Be real about all this. If, if I was in jail right now and somehow I managed to get a phone call with the church and I was trying to preach to y'all through the telephone over the loudspeakers from prison, don't answer this. Just let it sit. How many of y'all would really keep coming to church because the pastor's not here. He's in prison. He preaches faith. He preaches God is in control. He preaches lay your burdens on Jesus, but yet he's in jail. Yeah, yeah, y'all thinking now. That's what he's saying. Don't let it be a discouragement to you because I'm in prison and I'm writing this to you. Church, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of godly people in prison right now. All around the world. Some of them is in prison simply for doing what we're doing right now. Some have a death sentence on their life in prison simply for preaching the gospel. That is their crime. Oh, my bad. That's what Paul was in prison for, wasn't it? For preaching the gospel. They're in prison for the same reason. So don't, dis don't dismiss things. This is a perfect teaching. Don't dismiss things because the preacher teaches these things and preaches these things because the Bible teaches these things. But these eyes are seeing something different come to pass. Is it really? Can anybody see the power of God working through? Looking back, can we see how God used Paul? 
in prison, you realize we would not have a lot of these epistles of Paul that we hold so, so close to our hearts because of the teaching. Had he not been in prison to write them, think about it. If he was not in prison to write these letters, where would he have been? Out there on the road, teaching and preaching the gospel. He wouldn't be writing these things that we're learning about Jesus from right now. There was a purpose, and in that day, I got zero doubts. There was people that's like, I don't understand why Paul's in prison. I don't get it, God. Why, is, why God release him so he can go preach the gospel? Because roughly 2,000-ish years later, people are still coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because Paul was in prison to write these things. God has a plan. Just because we don't understand it at the moment does not mean that it's wrong. It just means I don't understand something. So Paul says, don't be discouraged in the fact that I'm in prison. Don't let that be a hindrance to you. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Verse 14 says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Where does that Spirit live? Inside. Our inner man. See, whenever this body goes to the graveyard, when this body turns back into dirt and dust, that inner man doesn't go to the graveyard. That inner, that inner man, that inner being, that soul is who you truly are. That soul is what's going to live on forever. That soul is eternal. Where it goes, heaven or hell, is going to be eternal. This might be off subject, but it just popped in my brain, and we're going to go with it. Anybody? There's no kids in here, so... Anybody, y'all know what Russian roulette is, right? Anybody not know? Because if you don't understand that part... All right, Russian roulette. How many Christians are playing Russian roulette spiritually with their decisions in life? Right now, today, all around this world, Christians are playing that game of death spiritually with their life. And they, they want to use all kinds of excuses, all kinds of ways to camouflage the decisions they make, camouflage their sins, to make it to them not a sin. Sin still sin. From the biggest to the littlest, sin is still sin. Well, what's a big sin? I don't know. What is a little sin? I don't know that either because the Bible doesn't classify big and little. It says there's just sin and there's the one unforgivable sin. So telling the little white lie will send you to hell just as easy as being a serial killer and killing a hundred people. Sin is sin. Sin goes to hell. If you have sin attached to you when you leave this world, where do you go? Think about these things. How many Christians camouflage things? Jealous spirits is nasty amongst some Christians. Uh, I'm not jealous. I just... Stop right there. When you find that you have the need to explain or justify your thoughts and your actions as to why another Christian might think it's wrong, but you need to justify your actions, that might be a good sign to you that maybe there's a problem there. Gossip. Anybody ever gossip? Nobody raised their hands. Anybody ever lied about gossiping? <laughs> See, oh, <laughs> y'all didn't like that one. 
gossip is a nasty little thing. But we camouflage it. I'm not gossiping. I'm just warning you about this person. I don't want you to get trapped. I'm not gossiping. What are you doing? Just think about it. What kind of sins may be on our plate that we have camouflaged it with a different name? Look, I don't hunt like I used to. I got lazy. You know, I used to have to wear all the certain kinds of camouflage, the real tree, the mossy oak, the advantage. They had names. Now I got older and lazier and I just go get in a box with a window on it and it doesn't matter what you wear, right? The deer don't see that camouflage anyway. But we put all these different shades of camouflage on these things. Our attitudes are the same way. And I'm sorry, I've read, I don't know where it's at. It's, it's in Ephesians, we're going to get into it, about the Christian's attitude. We got to stop calling it by different names. Call it like it is. If it's sin, call it sin and stop doing it. Don't just sweep it under the rug and say, that's not really what I'm doing. Sin is sin. Just like this, and I looked down and seen it, just like this shirt. Some people says that's pink. This is not pink. This is manly magenta. Okay? There's a difference. That's pink, right? See, that's pink. There's a different color. It's perspective. This is manly magenta. You know what? You can call it what you want to. Sin is sin. Okay? We, we can't always put the perspective twist on it. Sin is sin. Dark pink, worse than light pink. Dark. See, that's what I'm talking about. Dark pink, light pink, flamingo, hot pink. Pink is pink, right? I didn't say that. This is mainly magenta. But think about it. You can call it all different things. Sin is still sin. That's right. But the world, and I'm sorry to say this, a lot of churches and church people, they like to just change the, the name of it. Ice cream comes in a lot of different flavors. You come to our house and you get the Neapolitan, and the chocolate disappears first, and then the vanilla disappears and the strawberry just kind of sits there, <laughs> waiting for me. I have to put it out of its misery. I got to go eat it. It's pink. It's, it's pink. Uh -oh, he got me. It comes in all different flavors, all different size containers, but it's still ice cream. Sin is still sin. The churches, the Christians have got to get out of this cycle of renaming something to make it okay because God's not okay with it. I don't care what we call it. He still looks at it as sin. Chapter 3, and I think we're going to start about verse... Let's start at verse 14. And as you're turning to it, I want to say thank you to everybody for being here this morning. I know God is going to bless you. This is not in, don't take this the wrong way. Just for getting up and coming to church, I believe God will bless His people. Even if you sleep through the whole service just for being here, I believe God will bless you. But that does not mean I encourage you to sleep through the whole service, okay? Right? <laughs> Couldn't pass up that opportunity. Amen. But folks, if we could just wrap our brains around how much God enjoys helping His people, how much God enjoys showing His love to His people and giving us these blessings, He, he, he desires to do that. We just got to let Him do it. How many times do we set up roadblocks, maybe unintentionally, we set up roadblocks to say, Lord, I'm not going to receive nothing today because 
I feel the sudden urge to be in the flesh. Is God going to bless the flesh? No. That's, I, I haven't looked yet, but at, at some point in Ephesians, it may be in chapter 4, that's really on my mind this morning about our attitudes, our Christian attitudes. Nope. It's in the first part of chapter 4, so we'll probably get there this morning. So chapter 3, verse 14 of Ephesians. It says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. And keep in mind as Paul is writing this, did I turn this on? Yeah, sorry. As Paul is writing this, he's in prison, and part of his prayer is to those he's writing this to, that they would be strengthened. Does anybody hear a pity party from Paul? No. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <clears throat> You didn't hear that from Paul. He's in prison. Writing to strengthen others. There's an example for us, folks. Be a blessing to somebody else despite our own circumstances. Be a blessing to someone else despite our own situations. It is possible. Paul did it from prison. Amen. Now... I don't know who's got what around here. Some of the study Bibles, I think in my Thompson Chain reference, there is a picture of those old style prisons like Paul was in. It was a big hole in the ground that went kind of back up into, a, into the wall to give him some shelter. In those days, whenever it flooded, guess what? The prisons got full of water. Or this type of prison did. Uh, there were some cases, y'all know what a cistern is? A cistern is the big holes that they dug out and carved out to hold water, to catch rainwater. In some cases, they used the cisterns as prisons. It's just a hole in the ground. Instead of dropping a bucket down for water, you dropped a prisoner down. Good luck, buddy. There ain't no getting out. And they let down food and water to them. Folks, uh, nothing like prison today. Prison today is a luxury compared to prison back then. And that's not making light of prison today either. But Paul, Paul was in a situation where he was still blessed. Even in prison, he had someone that could write or else they give him the utensils that he could write. Okay, Everybody didn't have that. So God used him in the midst of his troubles and his trials and his tribulations to not write letters to people saying, come help me, come break me out of jail, come help, come help, come help. But instead, he wrote letters of encouragement to other people. There's our example. Verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So there's clear indication that we have some understanding of the love of God, but not much. This agape type of love is far above and beyond anything our human minds can understand. But I promise you, that love of God, that agape love that He instills inside of us, is what helps us to feel the love and the compassion toward those that have wronged us. Don't raise your hands, but think about it. To those that have done you wrong, do you still love that person? Or persons, whoever, whatever. Do you still love them? 
Is it easy to love them? It takes a little bit of work, don't it? To those who have caused you pain and heartache, if you still are able to love them, that is a good sign to you that the love of God is dwelling inside of you. I mean, He loves us. He loved us when we hated Him, when we were sinners. He loves the atheists that don't even believe in Him. To the person that says, God, you're not real, God says, I love you anyway. And then what happens? Since we're going down this road, God says, okay, Christian A, Christian B, Christian C, here is your job. I need you all to go witness to this atheist. He needs to know who I am. Because I love him and I don't want him or her to go to hell. Go witness. Go share the gospel. Go tell him about Jesus. Christian A says, well, I can't. This is my only day off and I promised so and so I'd go to the river. Christian B. Well, I got, I got 15 minutes and it takes 30 minutes to get there, so I can't do it. Christian C. I'm telling you to go witness to this atheist. Tell him about Jesus or tell her about Jesus. Okay, Lord, I'll do it. The day rolls around. He ain't done it yet. She ain't done it yet. The atheist dies and goes to hell. What's wrong with Christian A, Christian B, Christian C? Where's the love? Where's the compassion? Don't answer it. Just think about it. Love and compassion. If we as Christians could truly get our hands wrapped around this love, at least enough to be able to do what God says, to love those that hate us and to love those that despise us and love those that despitefully use us and love those that curse us. Okay? Love those that makes fun of us and mocks us because we're Christians. If we can just get our hands around that love to the point that we don't feel resentment, we don't feel hatred, we don't feel anger, but we feel that compassion because that person... In their mind, they may think they know what they're doing. They really don't know what they're doing. They really don't grasp what they're doing. They're working out of emotion. They're working out of anger and feelings. What's going to happen at some point in their life, they're going to come down this road and they're going to be like, oh, I wish... Let me rephrase that. So many people who have lived that life, when they come to the end of their time, they ask for some type of holy person or a religious person, a preacher, a priest or something. They ask for them to be there. I'm dying. I need, the, I need the Christian. I need the priest. I need the Pope. Whatever it is that they think they believe in, they need that. Why do you suddenly need it now because you're dying, but you didn't need it then? Inside each of us, there is that capacity that I talk about all the time. There is a place there. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Their temple is inhabited by their own things. Okay? There's that desire for spiritual things, for godly things to be inside of us, and they have tried to stick the square peg in the round hole. And when they come to the end of the way, God created us. He designed us to be spiritual beings they know it. The atheist right now today, deep down inside, they know it. They just refuse to accept it. Amen. It's that simple. And sometimes it only takes a Christian that is willing to show that agape love. Mr. or Miss Atheist, whoever you are, I, I don't understand why you take the stance you do, but I love you anyway. I'm going to get back to this. I won't quit putting it down. I'm going to back away. Those that were in Sunday school this morning, I told you about uh, this guy from Africa that started a satanic church in Africa. I don't remember his name. And during one of his recent satanic rituals, he had a Jesus encounter. He's now Christian. 
He's now telling his experience. He has stopped his evil and his wickedness. He has started all the processes of closing down the church that he started. And do you, in the article I read and part of the, the testimony that I watched, there is something specific that fits into this discussion very well. Anybody want to guess what it is? When he was doing that evil and that wickedness, there were a lot of Christians that just dismissed him and stay away from me. But there was some, and I believe he called their name, that told him they loved him anyway. When he hated them, they said, well, I love you anyway. And they showed him love. That's the Christians that he remembers. That is the ones that he's thanking God for right now. Because if it had not been for them, he may have never had that Jesus moment. Because they loved him. Even though he hated them, even though he had wickedness in his heart toward them, they still loved him. Now, I know, I know Lindsey Grove. I know there's love here. And I know anybody that walks in those doors will get hugs. I've told them that for the, before they ever walked in the first time. You better expect some uh, handshakes and hugs. It's a loving church. Every church ain't like that. This guy, he's a white guy. He's bald. He has a big tattoo that comes down his head down through here. I don't know what it means, but some churches, if he walked in those doors, they would start like backing up. Some Christian be like, you need, there's something off. You've got a tattoo, you've got this. Anybody in here got a scar? Anything? Yeah. You remember what caused that scar too, don't you? I got plenty of them, and I remember what caused a lot of those scars. Can I take them? Can I erase them and make them go away? No. I can't. If I tried to get rid of some of these scars, it'd probably make a bigger scar. They're part of the past. I don't know why this is coming out today. This is, I promise, was not part of the lesson, but it's coming out anyway. Somebody walks in those doors covered in tattoos from head to toe. And they said, I received Jesus yesterday and I'm looking for a good church and I feel like God sent me here. Oh, we can't let Him in. I've heard this. Not here. Not here. I've heard this from other Christians. We can't let them in here looking like that. That's their scars from the previous life. Oh, they got, they got skulls tattooed on their arms. They did that before they was a Christian. They can't fix it. Well, I guess they can if they're rich. Thousands and thousands of dollars for tattoo removal. You're going to hold the past against somebody? You're going to hold the past whenever Paul was Saul and he was murdering Christians? No. Paul was forgiven. Jesus forgave him and used him. Jesus forgave him and used him mightily. Why can't Christians forgive people of their past and move forward and let allow them to be used of God? Because they don't fit my mold. They don't fit my stereotype. A Christian should look like this, should dress like this. You know what? Paul was a murderer before he was a Christian. <clears throat> All right. That is a rabbit trail. I don't know why we went down it. But maybe it was for somebody. I'm going to trust that somebody needed to hear that. Love them. Doesn't matter who they are. And we can, we can joke about some things. But in reality, we've still got to love them. There are some people in this world, you know, your inside voice says, I'd like to do the Bugs Bunny and Tweety Show thing. I'd like to hug them and squeeze them and squeeze them and pat them on the head and call them uh, George, the abominable snowman thing. Remember that? That's it. Hug him and squeeze him and love him. 
And every time that he would hug him, his eyes would bulge out and his head would... Sometimes our inner thought says, I would like to hug somebody like that. We've got to get a grip on these feelings and these emotions. Okay? We, we, we can't hug them till their eyes pop out because we're mad or we don't like the way they're doing something. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Got to pray for them. Anybody pray for this nation? If you don't, today's a good day to start. Anybody pray for the leadership of this nation? That's not just one person. That's a good bunch of people. Y'all pray for the leadership of this nation. If you don't, today's a good day to start. So, love them regardless of what you think about them. Regardless of... I've told you many times about the lady I used to work with. She understood my stance. And I never treated her any different than the other people I worked with. But she knew when it came to the Gospel, she knew my belief, her lifestyle was sin. But we still partnered up on projects. We still did our job and it didn't affect anything. And I will never forget the day. I still remember the seat that I was sitting in. Second one from the wall in the corner. When she walked by going to break and dropped a note on my desk, I was on the telephone with a customer. And whenever that phone call was over and I unfolded that letter and read it, she, this is not bragging on me, this is just what we're talking about. She wanted to thank me for not treating her mean and bad for her lifestyle decisions. She also wanted to thank me for my stance on the gospel. Her lifestyle was sin. And telling, whenever she asked me, I told her. I didn't hold it back. I told her. But I still treated her like a human being. I didn't treat her any different. And in that letter, she told me that she got right with God. In that letter, she told me that she realized her lifestyle was wrong. And she changed. She was going to church. Now, I'm friends with her on Facebook. Now, she's married. She's married to a man. She puts Scripture on Facebook. That's something in my life that I won't forget. She will stand here and she will tell you, I wasn't born this way. I chose to be this way. But that's, we're, we're getting off in the weeds. The point is, I loved her. I didn't mistreat her. I wasn't mean to her. But I also didn't back up and say, well, I changed my, my stance. I, I compromised the gospel because it offends you. I made it very firm, very solid. This is my stance. I will work with you and we will be friends. We will continue on like nothing ever happened. If not, it's because you decided not to do it. Not because of me. It made a difference. Love them with the agape kind of love. Jesus, God, loves everybody despite their sin. But He also says, I hate all sin and no sin's going to enter in. He loves the person, not the sin. We got to be the same way. All right. Verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. So that Holy Ghost power that's working in all of His people, because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? According to the power that worketh in us, Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. All right. Chapter 4 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, that means in, okay? Prisoner in the Lord. 
He's not literally a prisoner of the Lord. He's a prisoner in the Lord because He chose this life. Okay? He's a servant. I beseech you. Now here's some instruction that we need to do. Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Okay? Dustin's words. That you walk appropriately of the calling wherein you are called. And your calling and your conduct, your calling and your actions, they should uh, balance out. Right? Means there should be no difference in your calling and your actions. There should be, you shouldn't be the two faced Christian talking out of one side of your mouth and doing something different out of the other. Now, verses 2 through 6, we want to spend some time on. This is. This is what I was talking about a little while ago. This is, this is going to teach us the Christian attitude. Okay? So, it's got some bigger words. We're going to break these words down. We're going to talk about them. Uh, I want you to apply these words to your life as we're, we're reading it and say, am I like that? Do I need to work on that? Or is that nothing like me? Meaning we need a lot of work on that. So walk appropriately, walk worthy of the vocation or the calling wherewith you're called. How are we supposed to go about doing the work that God has called us as Christians to do? Well, for starters, we're supposed to do it with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. That's one of them we got to read a few times and let it soak in in pieces. All right, verse 2. With all lowliness. Somebody mentioned this in Sunday school. Being humble. Okay? With all lowliness. And meekness. Gentle. Is that a good way of putting meekness? Gentle. With long suffering. And that's patience. Okay? So you're to... Do the work that God has laid on you to do. You're to do your calling humbly, meaning I don't know all the right answers. I've got to depend on God and meekness. So I'm supposed to do it gently, gently, with long suffering or patience. Remember my little saying I like to say get some patience or become a patient. Okay? Forbearing one another in love. A good word for forbearing is endure. Enduring one another in love. Y'all need to let that one soak in for a minute. Enduring one another in love. In Dustin's words, putting up with somebody else in love. You ever have problems in your life or somebody co-workers whatever family members that I don't know whatever their deal is they're like how do you put up with that I bite my lip I bite my tongue and I, I endure them in love right that's what it's talking about can anybody do that if you want to test that test your ability to forbear one another in love you call up somebody you ain't talked to in a long time and you say well how you doing oh let me tell you like, oh, oh I'm sorry I ask it's reality we've all been there right go to Walmart I ain't seen you in forever how you doing oh let me tell you oh no 
sorry, I, I've got this, I've got that, I've got the other, this is falling apart, that's falling apart, this is happening. Two weeks later, you're still standing there, enduring in love. Tolerate. Tolerate. That's a good way. Put up with it. Tolerate it. Endure it. In love. Is it easy? Not always. Sometimes it takes more enduring than others. But we got to do it. We've all been there. We've all done that. And if we're all honest, sometimes we've been the one that somebody else had to endure. They had to endure us. And then at some point we're like, oh man, I'm, I'm that person. I'm doing that thing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being patient. But I'm going to be quiet now. You know, we, we, we catch ourselves. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, with patience, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring, um, that's to put an effort. Okay? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Putting forth some effort or some work to keep the unity of the Spirit. There is one body. So, all right, there is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So does that mean to tell us that there, when it says there is one body, that is the church? That's not Lindsey Grove. That's not every other church in the world. That is the church that Jesus is the head of, that we are all a part of. Okay, that means Lindsey Grove is a part of that one body. The Baptists are a part of that one body. The Church of God is a part of that one body. The Assemblies of God is part of that one body. The Church of Christ is part of that one body. The Nazarenes are part of that one body. The go down the Pentecostals, go down the list. They're in that body. No one of them is the one body. We're a part of the one body. And granted, I understand some thinks they are the one body. I can't fix that. Okay. Um, my my stance on some of those teachings is this: that those that think they are the only one or they're the one body, their belief system came out of the Reformation at the same time all of these other denominations came out. What makes one think that suddenly they're the only one when they all came out and stemmed out at the same time? Just think on that one. One Lord, well, let's just start back at four. There's one body, that is the body of Jesus, and one Spirit. When we're born again in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost comes into us. That's the same Spirit that goes into all of God's people, right? There's not different brands and different flavors. There is one Holy Ghost. There's one Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope, of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all. Who is above all. And through all. And in you all. So there's a lot of ones. And there's a lot of alls. There's one deity. Trinity. One God above everything. There's one church. A lot of local bodies, but there's one church. That's the true Christians. That's the true Christians. But that one is a part of all of us. The body has many members, but there's yet one body. Verse 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace. That's a promise. But unto every one of us is given grace. Remember grace. The unearned, unmerited favor of God. It's freely given unto every one of us 
according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That's a whole other topic on verse 9. We're going to let that one go for today. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now verse 11, if you don't know what this is called, this is the fivefold ministry. It's a good place to write a note if you don't have one. This is the fivefold ministry. Verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. So I want to talk about this one for a minute. Is the, y'all believe that it's just randomly put in there like, oh, I'm, these are the five things that God does, so I'm just going to write them down. Or are they in a specific order for a specific reason? They're in a specific order for a specific reason. Well, how do you know that? I'm glad you ask. Let's start at the end of the verse. Teachers. Okay, you're a, let's say you're a teacher. This person is a teacher. Their calling is to be a teacher. Does that mean this teacher can do all the things listed above? The apostle, um, the, apostle the prophet, evangelist, pastor, misty? You're a teacher. Does that make you, are you able to be the pastor? No. Your calling is to be a teacher. Her calling is to be a teacher. Now, the next one up is pastors. I know one of those. I know one. The pastor, I'm not an evangelist, right? I don't go out all over the place preaching the gospel to other churches. I pastor this church. My job, my responsibility, my calling is here to this congregation, to these sheep, right? But, so if I'm not going up the ladder in those things, what I can do is pastor according to my calling, and I can also teach. Y'all see where this is going? Anybody ever heard teaching come out of this mouth besides just pastoring? Yeah? The next one up is evangelist. Evangelists are not apostles. They're not prophets. But evangelists can preach. That's what they do. They preach. They can pastor. And they can teach. You go up another level and you get to the prophet. The prophet is not an apostle. He's a prophet. Uh, but at the same time, the prophet can evangelize, can pastor, and can teach. And then the... The first one listed in verse 11 is the apostle. The apostle can do all those things. It's not an accident that it's listed this way. The apostle, this, we all have a calling and it's not something that we're supposed to put somebody up on a pedestal and say they're better than anybody else. It's a calling. It's a job. You go to some of these businesses... Um, okay, in the position I used to be in... I had worked my way up through the ranks, so to speak. I was, I built part of the call system that the company used. I built the phone system that come in so I knew how to route all the phone calls. The people out in the other departments didn't know how to do that. But I built it. I knew how to work on it. I built it. I designed it. Then I could go down to the next level. I could report on all the stuff that happened in there out of the database write my own queries, or I could go out on the floor and I could take the phone calls that they were taking in customer service. I helped set up some of the system they use so I know how to use it. But yet they, from the customer service standpoint, they could not come up there to my office and start building out call flows to say if a phone call comes in and presses one, send them over here. They didn't know how to do that. 
I could work my way backwards and do all those things before me. But if I was back there, they couldn't come forward and do what I do. They didn't know how. Same stance with this. The apostle is not to be put on a pedestal and say he's better than everybody else. But the apostle is at a higher ability, a higher calling. Now, I mentioned this, I think, Wednesday night. Pastors are going to be judged differently than the congregation. Whenever we leave this world and it's time for a judgment, God's going to hold us to a different standard as pastors. Same thing with these. God's going to hold the apostle to different standards. There's going to be more to answer for as an apostle than somebody in the congregation. That doesn't put the apostle on the pedestal. That just means more responsibility for the apostle. But if we, as parts of the body, would all do our part and we would abide in our calling, this body would work together like that right there and everything would happen according to God's plan. Is that reality? No. But it's the way it should be. So there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. We're fixing to wrap it up, but i got to finish this part. Why did He give these different offices? Why did He give these different forms of administration? Verse 12 answers that question. He gave the fivefold ministry for the perfecting of the saints. Perfecting does not mean perfecting, like we think about it. Perfecting here means to equip or to furnish. So let's read it that way so it helps our understanding. Why did He give us the fivefold ministry? For the equipping of the saints. What do we need equipped for? For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. For the building up of the body of Christ. Remember this, in Sunday school this morning, we talked about that uh, we were all ministers. And some, those that sing songs, they're ministers. They minister in song. Teachers are ministers. Preachers are ministers. All Christians are ministers according to the Great Commission. We're to go out and share the gospel with the whole world. So we come to church where there is a form of the fivefold ministry working to equip the Christians to go out and share the gospel. Well, how long is this supposed to happen? Verse 13 answers that. It tells us how long. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Well, how long is that? That's pretty much as long as we live. Until this world comes to an end. Because there's always going to be somebody that doesn't know Jesus, that doesn't know Christ. We're going to wrap it up right there. There's always going to be somebody that needs to hear about Jesus. And if we will abide by our calling and do what Jesus has laid on our hearts to do, there will always be somebody, there will be a willing vessel or a willing tool that God can use to share the gospel with somebody. My prayer is that He calls me. Your prayer should be, Lord, use me. And don't get stuck in the mud with words. Okay? The, the Bible is the living Word of God. It is our instruction manual. But don't get stuck in the mud trying to do step one, step two, step three. Jesus calls you. He lays it on your heart. If you will follow the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, He will lead you and He will guide you. Amen. And it doesn't matter what it is. Whether it's just to share the Gospel. Tell somebody about Jesus that's never heard about Him. Whether it's to lay hands on the sick that they should recover. Whether it's to lead somebody to salvation. You name it. There's a lost and dying world outside these doors that needs Jesus. 
And all of us are here today according to that Scripture so that we can be equipped to go out there and tell them about it. Church is... The church, the local church, the local body of believers, yes, there are certain things that has to be preached because you've got people here. There are certain instruction that has to be given. But church is not a place to beat people over the head with the Bible. Church is a place to... A lot of things have to be addressed. Sometimes there is church order that has to be addressed. Well, why do you have to address church order? Because somebody lets sin and flesh creep in and get in the way. These things have to be dealt with. But that is still a form of equipping and preparing people. So if they know how to conduct themselves in church, they know how to conduct themselves outside the church. Everything is to be done decently and in order. Whenever God sends you outside of this building to do His work, it will be done decently and in order. If your version of decent and in order is to wrap the Bible around a baseball bat and go through hitting people with it, saying, I'm going to beat the Word into you, that's not going to work. You're going to drive people away. It goes back to the earlier part of the discussion. Before you do any witnessing, before you do any sharing of the Gospel, before you do anything, you've got to love them. That is the foundational principle of everything that a Christian is to do and how we are to conduct ourselves is to do it in love. Everything else builds on top of that. If, if there's no love at the foundation, then whatever you try to stack on it's fixing to fall. Right. Amen. All right. Let us stand. Does anybody want to be prayed with?